in asynchronous reality, we're in the same space, in the same shared space, we're co-located, but at different points in time. So it's the same here, but a different now. If you compare it to an answering machine, an answering machine plays you back what you missed, a message that someone else left to you at a time that is convenient to you. The difference to an answering machine to asynchronous reality is that we can make sense of the events as they happened in the shared environment. What we've built here is essentially a tracking system that uses multiple depth cameras that allow us to combine and stitch together the volumetric appearance of the space that's being covered into a coherent 3D mesh. And then based on processing that mesh in real time, we can start isolating objects. Then based on the isolated objects, performing segmentation on them, we can then start to identify them. So we can build up a notion of what is happening in the space and what's in this space. We can take a piece of the office home and be co-located, kind of like you see here. I think technical feasibility is going to be there probably much sooner than the point in time at which we figured out what's actually desirable. Can you walk us through how this research really started? I'm an assistant professor here at uh, ETH Zurich in Switzerland uh, in the computer science department. And I, I run the sensing interaction and perception lab. We deal a lot with human augmentation, sensory systems, augmenting perception of perceiving systems, such as this one, as well as of human perception. And we've been playing around with in the past couple of years, really, is our perception of space and time in various forms. So for instance, a couple of years ago, we explored the notion of uh, what it might mean if you move around in your physical space, but you see something vastly different. Like while you're walking a canvas here, you walk around in Manhattan virtually. And so here we're basically doing the complement. We're exploring the perception of time on an individual base in a shared space. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between asynchronous reality, which is what we're seeing here right now, to virtual reality? So in virtual reality, we're basically, we can sit next to each other, but I'm in this space and you're in a different world, you're doing something else. In asynchronous reality, we're in the same space, in the same shared space, we're co-located, but at different points in time. So it's the same here, but a different now. Interesting. All right. So there is a point in uh, one of the videos. I think this is the shorter summary video of the mm -hmm. paper. And it's coming up here in this video for anyone that's watching this. And uh, she brings in an object, puts on the table, he turns around, and it's shiny. And that's it was right. a light bulb click moment for me. Have you played Horizon Zero Dawn? I have not yet, actually. This feels to me like a fundamental game design technique, like making an object shine in a video game is a classic way of making people know, go and grab something. And here it's being applied to go pick up a physical object and notate that there's actually an audio message attached to it throughout Horizon Zero Dawn. Objects everywhere have holographic messages that play back when you realize that these things are interactable around your environment, it's very similar what we've seen in science fiction being realized here. And there's a point in this paper where it describes the necessity for depth sensors almost yeah. everywhere within a physical space to enable right. this kind of interaction. How likely a future is that for our viewers out there who might be feeling a little bit of future shock right now? I, I think it really depends where you are. I think at some points in the world, it's already there. So for instance, I spend a, a lot of time over the past decade living in Seattle and working there. But you have stores that are equipped with camera systems so they can track you throughout the store. They know what you're doing. They know the objects you're interacting with. What are you picking up? What are you placing back? They can track all of these actions and they can make sense of them like what's happening. And they can do this in isolation from other people that might be walking around you and interfacing with you, interacting with you. There are already systems present in the world that, that try to make sense of what's happening in a space that's being monitored by cameras and not just understanding what are the actions that are being performed here, but also who are the people? What are the shapes that are involved? Is it like a, a tall person reaching up and, and picking something? Is it a small kid? Is it two kids? Is it a dog? Depending on the type of object really interacting in and scene, it might have a different semantic. Is an object that's being picked up being stored away in a bag? 
what kind of bag is it? Are we witnessing shoplifting here or does it even matter? Because we know that the object's been picked up. In research, what we don't do a lot in mixed reality research and human computer interaction, which is our community, we're basically exploring what interaction and living and the interface between computers and us and the interface between two people and multiple people could be in the future by essentially building an environment that might exist in the future, maybe in a slightly different instantiation, but from its capabilities could be there. But it's probably not even too far out. So what we've built here is essentially a tracking system that uses multiple depth cameras that allow us to combine and stitch together the volumetric appearance of the space that's being covered into a coherent 3D mesh. And then based on processing that mesh in real time, we can start isolating objects. And then based on the isolated objects, performing segmentation on them, we can then start to identify them. So we can build up a notion of what is happening in the space and what's in this space. So there's a table. Now there's an object on the table. Okay, there's something coming in. That's a person, right? A person's moving. There's a door. The door is opening. So we can basically derive from that action sequences. And that's exactly what we're doing in this system to essentially understand what are the actions that have happened in the space and what are the ones that are meaningful for the person while they tuned out. So we call this a focus mode here. I think the idea largely originated when we all had to go back to the home environment, which at least in my case or in our case was not made for working. And all of a sudden you hear people around you on the phone and so on. So wouldn't it be great to you know, have a focus mode for the real world, to be immersed in your space, to be productive, to work, to focus, and then later on still get a sense of what has happened around you that is relevant for you. So I found it super interesting what you just mentioned, this appearance of this hologram. And we, we had a lot of debate going back and forth what it should appear as, because it can't just be a plain object, because otherwise the person with the headset on would then think, Maybe I missed this earlier. Maybe it was there before. I don't know. So it has to look slightly different, but it can't be completely like sort of imaginary because it's an actual object. You can reach out and grab it. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. There was another thing that I noticed in the paper. There was mentioned that this could be useful in future work environments. I've heard the word VR answering machine associated with this. This mm. is the, the, the VR equivalent of like, I'm somewhere else, please leave a message. <laughs> you talked about going home through COVID or, or, or not working at mm. your, your normal workspace. VR yeah. headsets are very much being pushed as a remote work solution. There is the potential that you're working in your own personal space and doing much more virtual co-location, not physical co-location. And I'm trying to understand if that's the likely scenario we're in for the future, how likely is it that the specific interaction we're seeing mm -hmm. walk through here is not going to happen? Mm -hmm. Where well, actually this is the perfect moment. We have elements of this right in here where she teleports in and then it's in the same space that he gets to basically see what she's referring to. So it's virtually co-located, physically distanced totally remotely. Just to touch on that answering machine point, I think that's a very interesting one. Because I think if you compare it to an answering machine, an answering machine plays you back what you missed, a message that someone else left to you at a time that is convenient to you. The time here is also convenient for you, but the difference to an answering machine to asynchronous reality is that we can make sense of the events as they happened in the shared environment. So when someone places something and leaves a message or tells me something, I get to revisit that in the very space where it was relevant in, in the environment, when it happened and where it happened. Sometimes I have a couple of voice messages on, on the voicemail and you play them back and then you're trying to establish context. Like, oh, that was a follow-up to the email. I haven't checked my emails yet, right? Mm. Things like that. But here, this actually brings us to this causality graph that we're building up in the background. We're trying to understand what are the actions that have led to this, for instance, the uh, 3D printed piece here being placed on the table. This is indicated by six here. But in the meantime, she actually came in, she dropped the first version, then she moved it around, added a second version, added something to it. Our system builds up this notion of what happened to the individual elements that then contributed to the final state that the user starts interacting with. 
So in order for me to understand what that final state is, I need to see all of the steps that led to this, but not the other steps. So maybe other things were placed down, other people came in. If I really only care about this one object that's on the table, I need to only consume that part. And again, it's registered in the space where I'm in. Now, your second question was, how relevant is this for remote work when we're at home? Perhaps this is a, a personal opinion, but for me, the environment helps me switch into a certain mode of productivity. So for instance, when I'm at home, you know, I'm resting or chilling on the couch, I can do email, I can do phone calls, but I'm not in the mood of like writing long documents. Whereas if I'm in the office in front of the whiteboard, I can do that. My brain's in that mode. I get to be there. What's really nice about this is now we can take a piece of the office home and be co-located, kind of like you see here, right? When she teleported in, I think she was displayed as green, um, to sort of put myself into that zone, be productive. It's kind of almost invisible in the video. These are the offices that we have at ETH Zurich. This is what they look like, but the rooms are actually a lot bigger. They're also shared. There are multiple students and postdocs in here. You don't really see that because our 3D capture system captures the entire space. We polished it up a little bit, made it a little smaller. So you're in your own personal space, everything feels familiar. These are the actual elements that are around you. So for instance, the, the tables are real, right? There's a round table, the drawer, everything is real. The appearance is the same, but the room is slightly different. So it's basically a virtual overlay that resembles reality almost to the appearance, but ever so slightly different. So this is a square room, the real office was slightly bigger, things like that. So I think you're touching on a really interesting point of continuing to play with this to understand what are the implications on people's perception when it comes to work and what are the effects on collaboration. Here, Andreas is a very big fan of focus work here, right? He's concentrating on a task, he doesn't want it to be disturbed. But at the same time, what asynchronous reality also reconciles in many ways is the need for face-to-face -face communication. So I can't just totally tune out and ignore everything that's happening around me. Mm. Anything that is relevant to me, I need to see and interact with and respond to. This was showing some of the equipment that you had to set up. And I noticed that was referenced in the paper as one of the things that would, in a future scenario where this was actually, the environment would have these sensors probably embedded into the... Right furniture or into the That's objects right. in the room in a far uh, more reasonable manner. We've talked about this idea that maybe the headset could watch you when you're not using it. It could potentially be on a charging stand. And when you walk into the room, it might have voicemails for you. We've had that discussion on our show previously. Millions of quests in the market, and they could theoretically enable it so that your phone rings with a messenger call. Or if you're in view of your headset, you could let your headset ring with your messenger call and then you could go mm -hmm. put the headset on. And there's some advantages. You've got like a, a dirty shirt or something. You don't want to actually go on camera right at that moment. You can actually show up to that phone call with your avatar instead of actually right. showing your real appearance. So there's a potential avenue there. But you're talking about uh, a level of sensing that even when I mentioned that people were unsettled by the idea of mm -hmm. that much sensing. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what is the path where this much sensing improves a person's day? Because that's where we're going with this. I have all sorts of right. situations around my household, like dirty laundry and tasks to do, things we forget about, items running out of stock right in the fridge. We didn't have the one ingredient we needed for the meal that night. All those things mm -hmm. could be assisted with considerable amounts of computer vision running throughout my whole home. That's right. And I just have to understand how many pieces of equipment here are actually going to be needed in my house to start seeing this future you're uh, playing out for me actually take hold. Okay, there were there were a lot of questions in turn. <laughs> in you talked question, for a while right? there, so I thought I'd throw a lot back fair. at you. <laughs> totally fair. I like the questions a lot because they overlap with a lot of the questions that we ask ourselves. The last question was, how many of these uh, do you actually need? So if you look at the depth camera here, which is essentially the same camera, just that the front part here really is relevant. The rest is largely for the microphone array. This front part is what's in the HoloLens too. So this is already miniaturized. 
right? The RGB camera here, also the field of view and the wide field uh, operation that the dev camera has is pretty large already. So it's in entirely thinkable that you could embed them in, you know, the corners of a room, maybe in the door of a fridge or, and see a lot of the, the, the room already. Mm -hmm. The second question that results from that is, how do you deal with occlusion? So if it's a single person, you have four cameras, one in each corner, that's probably good enough. But then what if you open the door of the fridge, so you block two cameras out, then you don't see the person anymore, you only see them from behind. But then this is where you said methods from computer vision come in. Given that I've already seen you from the front, I know what you're wearing and so on, and then temporarily you open the door of the fridge, I can reconstruct what the front looks like if that's even relevant. Now going one step uh, uh, back again, what do you actually need? The fact that we're capturing appearance and shape of everything that's in the room makes a lot of things easier for the platform that we built, but it doesn't need to be that way. So for instance, the way that we create the causality graph is totally agnostic to what's the meaning of the objects in the room. So if I place one object down, and then I use another one and push it. And then maybe I use a third one to push the second to the first. This creates a causality graph that still gets replayed. Also isolated and independent of other things that happen in the environment. My system doesn't have to understand what are the objects that were involved. The only thing it does need to understand is there was contact. There was contact, one impacted the other. So the, the, they create a chain. So I'll play all of that back in order to render uh, a, a transparent state that makes sense to the user so that there's a, a synchronized state of the world in their perception again. Now, if you add to what we capture, which is the whole volume and the appearance, another layer of processing on top, then you can go into semantic understanding where you say, okay, this is a table, it's round, it's this big, and this is a person, they're this tall, and then you can start um, doing recognition-based replacements there. So you say, maybe I don't show the, the shape of the person, the mesh, but I show their avatar instead because I recognized, oh, that's, you know, it's Naya entering the room. Okay, let me pick her avatar. And then it's not what the camera's captured, but it's a, a substitution thereof. The space where this happens, you see this here, is virtual. It looks very much like the physical space over here, but everything in here is a 3D model. So we have total authority over replacing things, modifying things, modifying their appearance entirely, or tuning them out, right? The VR headsets we have today are communications devices, but they're not phones mm -hmm. yet. It seems like the end goal is to replace some of these fundamental devices, but we need this user interaction to be ironed out. Even in this paper, there's discussion about how there's acclimatization needed. People need to get used to this idea. That's and right. even right now, we fundamentally can't understand it. $300 Quest is a very affordable gaming console, but mm -hmm. we are close to having a very high-end standalone VR headset with a depth sensor on it. You know, That's mm -hmm. our most recent reporting. What's needed to make this happen is going to be shipping on a standalone VR device by year end. So are we going to start seeing these kinds of interactions play out with that hardware as early as later this year and next year? Is that is, is what we're talking about a, a very soon-to-come preview or a very far-off preview? It, it helps trying to understand the difference between what's possible and what's desirable. I think in many of these things, and while this project is not an example of that, we run a lot of user studies with the technologies that, that we develop, often for empirical purposes to understand how do they um, facilitate for instance, input into a system. We had another project where we put uh, a wristband around your wrist, two of them, and then you type QWERTY on a table. No keyboard needed, but you use all 10 fingers. You just type ahead on the table in front of you, and you enter text, much like you would on a regular keyboard. We ran studies to understand, can people do this end to end? And it turns out, touch typists reach the speed that they would reach on a phone. That's pretty impressive. The question that we haven't tackled in that specific evaluation was, is that even desirable? Would people actually do this? And I think the same question is relevant here. So for me, you know, being you know, part of the development team, being part of my lab, we're probably a lot of different, we're very cross-disciplinary. So there's healthy debate going on on a daily basis. We exchange a lot of thoughts around that and we debate a lot, is this desirable, is this 
feasible when would we expect this but the moment that you would you know advertise this to the general public as a solution right you're sort of taking a stance you're saying okay this is what it's going to be like and then the, the market or nature out there has to give you the answer whether or not that's good it's mm. a real experiment in that sense and if they don't do it if there's no adoption then you fail so it's a very risky st uh, step putting this out there and saying okay this is the future it's here now we can use this and we should use it so so i i, I think technical feasibility um is going to be there probably much sooner than the point in time at which we figured out what's actually desirable and how do people interact in this space a good comparison i think that people can relate to already at this point is i'm in here my hands are represented pretty nicely this works really well as you said it's a low-cost device right i can pick this up from the store no problem i see half of your body right now right <laughs> uh, i don't see any legs um we all know why um <laughs> Do they even do they do they matter? For instance, some of the work that we've done uh, shows that they do matter, and that you can actually, in part, reconstruct the position of your feet from where your hands are and where your head is. Also, during activities such as walking, sitting down, standing up, and so on, and give you that holistic impression. The question then is that good enough for you to perceive your motions as natural? So that brings us back to the question: Is it desirable? Would there be adoption with the? Gen general public. And that's a really, really hard question, especially if um, you do uh, studies that we do in an academic setting with less than 100 participants. Extrapolating mm -hmm. from that to millions and ideally billions of users, extremely hard. There's going to be a lot of variation in how much you want to send out over the internet in the future, I think. That's right. right? As we were having this uh, discussion, I was imagining which sets of people I would want to let into my house at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Like there is a clean version of my house and there is a dirty version of my house. And there's certain people I would allow to see the dirty version and certain people I would only invite in to my home when it's a completely clean place. And it's interesting to think I could offer a reconstruction of my home. Mm -hmm. That is the empty, plain, clean, everyone's bed is made. And then if someone wants a live view, I could flip that on a per guest basis to my virtual home. But these are, again, interactions that I imagine people at Meta and Microsoft are working out, maybe Apple too. Those three companies are probably thinking very hard. I guess as a research organization, do you have any guidance if those people are out there watching this on what they need to be thinking about or the ethical considerations here at all. You're asking a lot of hard questions, right? It's very interesting because the moment that you develop a concept, which is what we're doing in research a lot, right? We're putting together a sort of a theoretical framework that makes sense. An incident occurs somewhere out there in the media and you're like, oh, this is something that we haven't accounted for. Or you learn something about public perception of something that you hadn't anticipated as much because you, we being the organization that we are, we can't integrate all of the participants that are necessary to have a voice here in the design of these systems. Essentially, we're creating a, a society here with norms, as you said, and behaviors and rules that are okay and that are accepted. But what those are, that can't just be dictated top down or created through a framework, but they also have to, I guess, organically grow and we'll have to see what catches on and what doesn't. I think related to what you said with the house, I can relate this to, to this so much, much of the previous two years has happened in Zoom, of course, or Microsoft Teams. And um, it, it makes the calls in the early morning very easy, right? Because you can take <laughs> them from home. That's pretty cool. You don't have to necessarily turn the camera on always, right? You can blur out your background, so it doesn't matter if it's too messy in your, in your household. That's something I appreciate a lot, right? That I don't have to worry about this. Rest assured, it's only sharing my face, right? Um, yeah. And we're also thinking, and there's research on this already, um, what happens if you replace people then with avatars so that I don't even have to care about what I look like in the morning, right? Maybe I'm super sleepy or... You know, I don't know, maybe my, my shirt has a stain on. doesn't matter. I'm being replaced w with an avatar. So I might be more willing to then share a, a visual representation of myself with someone else, even though it's not the perfect photo camera-ready version of it. So another thing that we're looking at also in the context of 
mixed reality when it comes to representing the real world is a concept called diminished reality, where you essentially selectively remove parts of the real world. Maybe you have a bedroom that you don't want to share that raises the question, why is the door even there, right? Maybe you have a public version of the house, but it, you know, it's much smaller inside than it really is, right? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, slightly rearranging my house so that it's an anonymous house. Is this going to be more useful in AR with a HoloLens type see-through headset or with opaque VR headsets? The way that we tend to think about this is as a continuum, really. And yeah. we're already starting to see devices and rumors about them that can switch between the two worlds. And this is very much how I would see it. There might be times, for instance, in this focus mode here, where I'm in a virtual replica of my office, where I can block out solidly everything that's happening around me, but I can still be in my office. I can be really located there, present there, and interact there. And then other times, I might prefer just augmentations of that space and interact with people and seeing them and perceiving them the way that they are. So something that can blend one to the other and back as needed is probably going to be closer to a solution that at least I would want mm. um, than, than you know, making this decision ahead of time. Because if everything is virtual, you have to reconstruct and embed, right? If everything is, is see-through, it's very hard to remove things, mm. right? That makes sense.